Thanks, everyone. Please take your seats. And good afternoon. My name is Steve Del Bianco, one of the organizers of the IGF USA. And, and today, we all know our featured speaker, Maureen Olhausen, as chair of the Federal Trade Commission and a distinguished Washington lawyer. But my first encounter with Maureen was in 2001, when I approached the Federal Trade Commission for help. My online real estate business was being blackballed by conventional realtors because we had the audacity to discount our listing commissions and give people a rebate when they bought a home. So I was directed by the FTC to the little tiny department with the most bureaucratic name you can ever imagine. And I had, therefore, I had no hope that the quote unquote Office of Policy Planning had the political will or any power at all to stand up to a entrenched legacy industry. So I go to the Office of Policy Planning and I meet a young attorney with a pleasant demeanor and a beautiful smile. And uh, Maureen listened carefully to the barriers to online competition that were hurting American consumers. And then I watched as uh, Maureen was showed the metal for which she is destined to be a commissioner and is currently the co-chair of the FTC. And as you will hear, when it comes to making the internet safe for competition and for innovation, Maureen's got game. So please welcome FTC Chair Maureen Olhausen. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Steve, for that lovely introduction. Uh, and thank you to IGA, um, I, excuse me, IGF USA for having me here today. It's, it's really a pleasure to see so many friends and colleagues who've been paying attention to these issues for so many years. So as we all know, the internet is a truly amazing phenomenon. And I use the term phenomenon because it's challenging to find a more descriptive noun. So the internet isn't an invention. It's an, amalg an amalgamation of at least thousands and probably millions of inventions. I oh, it's just, OK. I'm, I'm, I thought I pressed the wrong button or something, but I see it's just uh, giving um, closed captioning. So it's, it is a network, and it uses technology, but it isn't just a network or just technology. And if we think abstractly, the internet is a collection of ideas rendered in software and running on the constantly changing physical pieces of computers and wires and services and chips, and antennas and handsets and fiber optics and the list goes on and on. So the internet is more than its individual physical pieces. Indeed, the online world doesn't exist in any one location in the real physical world but it does intersect and interact with the physical world. And that intertwined nature is important. The internet offers powerful real world benefits because it is intertwined with the physical world. But this intertwined nature also means that real world constraints can limit the internet's benefits. Now such limitations can be economic or social or political, but I today wanna to talk about one specific limit. This type of real world constraint limits human opportunity, both online and off. Specifically, the limit I wanna talk about is when internet business ideas face real world resistance from entrenched incumbents and from those afraid of change. Now, as Steve mentioned, I've spent a significant portion of my career working on removing such limits. And early in that, I, at the FTC's Office of Policy Planning, I worked on an e-commerce initiative, and it involved things like online real estate, contact lenses, online sale of caskets, if you can believe that, but that's a real thing. Uh, but a key part, so that initiative's goal was to examine regulatory barriers to online commerce. And one of our big successes was a report that laid the foundation for the Supreme Court to ultimately uncork the online sale of wine and specifically in a decision that heavily relied on the FTC's report about online wine sales, the Supreme Court struck down two state laws that prohibited direct shipment of wines from out-of-state distributors, but allowed distribution, direct shipment from in-state distributors. So this is one example of removing a real-life barrier that reduced the promise of an internet-enhanced consumer experience. Now, however, that was back in the early 2000s. And a decade plus later, you might have think we've solved all those issues. The internet is ubiquitous now. Consumers regularly and increasingly shop online. 
But unfortunately, in the offline world, one type of barrier has grown significantly, going well back before the internet, starting in the 1950s. And one of the negative effects of this barrier is the diminishment of the potential of today's technology in the internet. So I'm speaking about unnecessary or overbroad occupational licensing. And states increasingly requires worker, require workers to have a license, have permission from their government to work in their chosen occupation. So going back to the 1950s, as I mentioned, less uh, than 5% of jobs required a license. And today, that figure is between 25 and 30%. So while licensing may be necessary, for some occupations, there is strong evidence that most occupational licenses are unnecessary. So for example, there are more than 1,000 occupations that are licensed in at least one state, but remain completely unlicensed in at least one other state, without an indication of consumer harm in the unlicensed state. And there are about 60 that are licensed in all states. So you can sort of say, like, OK, everybody agrees those should be licensed, but we have over 1,000 more where there, there isn't that agreement. And these regulations cost money and time and reduce worker mobility because states frequently do not accept licenses obtained in another state. Now, as the internet continues to facilitate remote work for more occupations, such workers may increasingly face unnecessary occupational licensing barriers, which will constrain the possibilities of the internet. So we've already seen some examples of this problem in the area of telemedicine. So for instance, the Texas Medical Board required an in-person meeting with a doctor before permitting the use of telemedicine services, but not services provided by a doctor over the phone. So you would get a lot more data in telemedicine than over the phone, but only the telemedicine had to have first an in-person meeting. So a Texas telemedicine provider, Teladoc, sued the board, alleging that the rules were any competitive. And the FTC support, uh, participated in that case, supporting Teladoc's position. And in May of this year, the Texas governor mooted the dispute by signing into law a bill that eliminated the in-person requirement. Now, that law is a big victory for patients in Texas. It expands their choices and brings new expertise to remote areas that had few or no healthcare professionals. But that battle does not end the war. We've seen other online examples in the various regulation of car sharing, for example, and offline burdensome licenses of occupations such as florists and hair braiders and interior decorators, which halt the entrepreneurial dreams of low-income and middle-income Americans and raise prices for all consumers. So that's why my first initiative as acting chairman of the FTC was to create an economic liberty task force. And the task force is shining a spotlight on the job-killing harms of unnecessary or overbroad occupational licensing. And it works with state leaders and other stakeholders to try to remove or reform such, led, such regulations. Now, my initiative has drawn significant media attention to the problem and its harmful effects on middle and low-income Americans and military families in particular, because often there's a lot of, if you're in the military, you have to get deployed, you move around the country, and the trailing spouse often works in um, a profession, a job that requires a license. And so each time they move, they have to get a new, a new license. It's very expensive, it's very time consuming, and uh, we believe, we're working with the Department of Defense on this, it's caused um, military spouses to have an unusually high unemployment rate, upwards of 20%. So we've received a terrific response from the Coalition of the Willing, and that's what I've talked about when I talk about this task force. That's what I'm trying to assemble, the Coalition of the Willing to work on these issues. So legislators and governors and other citizens who want to bring jobs and talents to their states and cities. And furthermore, the task force has held dozens of meetings with outside parties to learn about the extent of the problem and potential solutions, much like we did back when I met you, Steve, when we started doing the e-commerce initiative. So the task force's first roundtable event, public roundtable, will be held in DC this Thursday on July 27th, and will focus on license portability and job mobility. And you can learn more about this if you wish to attend by going to our website, ftc.gov slash econliberty. So I believe that many of the jobs of tomorrow will occur online or have online components. And the online world and the offline world are very different places. 
but economic liberty is as important in the online world as it is in the physical world. And unless we preserve economic liberty, liberty online and off, the internet will not reach its potential. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for having me here today, uh, and I'd be happy to take a few questions. We have time for two questions. Maureen, here's some questions since we're waiting. Uh, Steve Del Bianco. I, uh, we have to take the report of what is concluded here at the IGF USA and report it into Geneva at the United Nations in December. And uh, what would be the message you'd want us to convey about the lessons learned here with respect to internet dividends and what it takes to make the internet work for people? The message that I would suggest is that when you're looking at regulations, whether they are already in place or they're being proposed, is to say, who is this really benefiting? Is it benefiting the entrenched interests or is it really protecting consumers? And you know, it's, it's like public choice theory in action, right? You say the, 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 the benefits are concentrated on the industry and the costs are dispersed. I mean, and there are some regulations that are very, very necessary, uh, but we should have a good understanding of those for you know, health and safety and, and those kinds of restrictions. But if, if that isn't present, you know, I think ask that question, is this really necessary to protect consumers? Because so often these regulations are put forth with the idea that, oh, we're going to make sure consumers get the best service or the best you know, type of care without saying, well, are we reducing access for consumers overall? If everyone has, you know, has to have the Cadillac to drive on the, the internet road, um, what about the people who can't afford it, who are going to be walking, who will be, be worse off? So those are the kinds of questions I'd always a ask, um, you know, pretty tough questions, because so often they're just put forward as more regulation makes consumers better off, and that isn't necessarily the case. Thank you. My name is Marilyn Cade. I'm one of the, a member of the steering um, group of IGF USA, so I want to join everyone else in thanking you for joining us. But I'm going to ask a question about how we, uh, I think it's fantastic that we're trying to look at what, how do we advance digital dividends here, but I do all of my work in developing countries. And the concerns that are very, very real there about how digitization, how can uh, a country that is still trying to connect women and girls in remote villages and also trying to uh, update the delivery of citizen uh, services to citizens online in countries where huge numbers of the uh, population are not only digitally illiterate, but illiterate. So are there things we can be thinking about? I think we have been very successful as a country uh, in thinking about how we can contribute to improvements and benefits to the rest of the world. As we think about, as you think about your work, are you also thinking about how we can perhaps examine lessons learned that can be shared more directly? And then I will make a pitch for you planning to come and speak at the IGF in Geneva in December? Oh, well, th thank you for the thank you for the pitch uh, on that. I mean, uh, so I would say um, uh, two two things in response to that question because my real areas of expertise are consumer protection and competition, uh, and those two have a, you know, a very good intersection when when we look at them. So um, if we want consumers citizens to have the benefits of these new um, offerings and these, the new services that are out there, the new opportunities and ways to gather information for themselves and be more knowledgeable consumers. Uh, we need to also, uh, again, pay attention to the sometimes very well-meaning regulations that are a barrier to that. Uh, so, uh, and then the other part of that is to say, regulation isn't I'm not anti-regulation you know, regulation for, regula you know, uh, for anti regulation's sake, but to have a careful understanding of why it's in place, is it still serving? But also, sometimes you do need a certain level of regulation. So one of the things we talk about in the occupational licensing space is the fact that um, lower levels, so it's not a binary choice, all regulation or no regulation, 
is there a level that allows competition and service to exist, to, to be a you know, good choice for consumers? So I often think about how, uh, like for example, we've done a lot in the area of nurse practitioners, allowing nurse practitioners to practice to the top of their license. And so in some of these areas where telemedicine could really be an enormous boon for people who don't have good access to medical care, who don't have good access to information, allowing someone with a lower level of license than an MD to practice is very, very important to making the technology actually work, right? To have, have that service. And so, um, so regulation is really my area of expertise. So that, that's, I mean, other people understand, you know, education and uh, Bob knows a lot about deploying the, the infrastructure, but you have to get the regulatory framework right as well. Can we have another round of applause for Chairman Olhausen? Thank you.